We're going to talk about sources of magnetic fields, and in particular, we're going to be talking about the magnetic field from wires and calculating what that looks like. We are going to, we call this the Biot-Savart law, um, and what it tells us is the magnetic field from a current. Um, this is mu naught, the uh, a physical constant divided by 4 pi. This is the current. This is the a small segment uh, a small segment of the wire that should read L, and it's going to, uh, so we will, that's an L, um, cross product with a, a, the direction to the point. So this is from the point of the wire creating the magnetic field to the point where you are. It, R hat points from that point to the, to the other point, and R is the distance between those two points squared. All right, so here we have a current element uh, DL um, produces a magnetic field at some point P away from uh, away from that wire and um, we are going to and this is the magnetic field created by that small segment of wire so there is a small segment of wire of length DL we use the D because that indicates that eventually we are going to integrate over the entire wire um, so this is a tiny segment of the wire all right, so here we can consider what happens when we, uh, so we've got a small segment of a wire, a, a distance L away. Um, there's, we're gonna use the x-axis along here. Some of the same habits that we picked up from previous chapters, we want to indicate our axes on our figures. So I will go ahead and do that. We will do, I have to, doesn't matter. So this is going to be our x direction, and this is going to be our y direction. Uh, and now a small length of the uh, of the wire dl, not di. Um, so if we want to uh, figure out the magnitude, let us first. Um, so our r hat is like that, uh, and the dl, our current, is flowing up. So dl is up, cross product with r hat is like that, uh, and so that magnitude is db equals mu naught over 4 pi i and then over r squared, but that r squared is x squared plus l squared. Uh, and so that's our distance. And then we need DL and our hat has a length of one, but we need the sine of the angle between our hat and the um, between our hat and DL. So that is going to be L over the square root of x squared plus L squared. So here, I get a three halves, and there I get an L. And that gives us the magnitude. The, um, the direction is in that, it, so the direction is pointing towards U. All right, and the book, when it used this as an example, was um, specifically, look, it, it had specific values for the length. We're gonna skip over that. You can read the textbook as well. In fact, given that this is all the mirror images, it's a good idea to look at the textbook as a reference so that you're not getting the, the X's and the Y's swapped. All right, a wire segment carrying a current I. The path D and the radial, so the, the wire segment is radial. We're talking, so a circular segment of wire, and we are looking at 
the um, and we want to integrate around this point. What is the magnetic field around that point? So the R hat is in that direction. We are going to use a coordinate system where this is x, that's y, and we're going to use uh, polar coordinates. So we will use, actually, I want to orient the, orient the theta so that it is along the x-axis because that's the traditional, that's the most common orientation. So I'm going to put x, ooh, that's not a straight line. X is here, and Y is perpendicular to that. All right, and then we've got theta and the distance R. So when we do that, the B equals mu naught over 4 pi I and then I'm going to put the R squared. The DI is going to be R D theta, or sorry, the DL is R D theta. That's the length of a segment of wire in terms of the angle theta. And the sine of the, so I'm looking at a point P, the sine of the angle between so the angle between the current and R, as we go at any given point, that's always 90 degrees. So that sine of theta is always 1. And then we get, this is mu naught over 4 pi I over R D theta. All right, so that's for a small segment of wire. And then I'm going to integrate over, let's say we have a circle of wire. If we have a circle of wire, then the magnetic field is the integral of that from 0 to 2 pi. So I get mu naught over 4 pi i over the radius d theta. When I do the integral, I get a factor of 2 pi. So my total magnetic field is mu naught i over 2 pi r. So if I am looking at the magnetic field in the center of a loop of wire, this gives me the magnitude at that particular point. All right, so now we can consider other, so other scenarios. So this is a long, skinny segment of wire, um, and we're going to look at a point P above the wire, um, and we will draw our coordinate system in just a minute. The hard part in these problems is always setting up the integral. It's actually <laughs> the, once you set up the integral, then it's just doing the math. And where you can get yourself tripped up is that you will spend a lot of time, well, you'll think you have the integral set up correctly, and then, because calculus is, if you're in this class, calculus is still relatively new for you, so you're right, likely to make some stupid mistakes as you go along. That's perfectly normal. Hey, you guys see me doing this? I still make stupid mistakes. I've been doing this for a couple decades. If I am still making stupid mistakes, you are still going to make stupid mistakes too. All right, so we now have a long, thin section of current carrying wire, um, and we're looking at variable limits from theta, uh, from two different angles, theta 1 and theta 2. Okay, so now when we set up this integral, we have a small segment of the um, of the magnetic field. Well, first of all, let's look at what that direction is. 
So we're, we have a current in this direction, and our, so our segment L is in, uh, DL is in this direction, and the R hat is in this direction, although it's going to flip to that direction when we go, so it's gonna be here or there. The R hat changes as we, as we move around. So we've got L cross R hat. Either way, it's gonna be in this direction. So at point P, the, direction, the, mag the magnetic field is in that direction. Now, that makes sense because if, oh, ah, I'm using my actual right hand. I have to use my left hand because you guys see my left hand is my right hand. So we've got DL, and then actually it's going to be pointing towards U because DL crossed with R hat. R hat is always up, so it's always going to be that way. That should match what we get if we line our thumb up with the current and rotate around. When, our, when, we're above, when we're below the wire, the current is towards me. When we're above the wire, the, or sorry, the magnetic field is towards me. When we're below the wire, it's, above, it's towards you when we're above the wire. So, always in the same direction, but the, um, the magnitude of this DL cross with, um, with R hat, the magnitude is going to change as we go to different angles. So, we're going to write this as, these guys are just constants, so they come along for the ride. The current is constant. The R, we are going to use, so we are going from the origin, and... We will go, so this is X, and this is Y, and our R is always going to be the square root of X squared plus R squared. That's always R. And then our R hat is uh, so we're looking for the angle between i the, sorry dl and r hat and that's always going to be sine theta so we're going to have a sine theta here and here we're going to have x squared plus r squared now here i've mixed signs and uh I've mixed polar coordinates and Cartesian coordinates. Now I can write this, so I can write this sine theta as the, let's see, it's always R over, it's always the opposite over the hypotenuse. So I am always going to get that. So I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to delete that sine theta and replace it by an r. Ah, and I should have had r squared. So I'm going to, so I have r squared times sine theta. So I have r on the top and then x squared plus r squared to the three halves. Whew. All right, and then um, I have, I need my small segment DL. That is just a segment DX. Now I have it written in Cartesian coordinates, and I can do a few different things with it. Um, this is written it as if you have two angles, uh, theta 1 and theta 2, that makes it hard to consider. We're just going to consider what happens with an infinitely long wire, which is a really good approximation for several different physical situations. In that case, our magnetic field is, here I'm going to lump out the constants. Let's see. 
I would like to have something unitless. So I am going to write this as u naught i, and then I'm going to write this v x over r. Here I want x over r squared plus 1 to the 3. Oh, I, you cannot read that. I'm going to have to make that. I will explain my logic in just a minute. I'm basically trying to manipulate the constants so I have something unitless, and that's going to tell me that's going to help me avoid stupid mistakes because a lot of the things that I do, I'm trying or avoid or catch stupid mistakes. The difference between me and you is not how many stupid mistakes we make, it's how easily we catch them. All right. So then here I've got r the x over r, so I'm going to have to, to compensate for that r, I'm going to give another factor of r. Here, I want, so r, I want to pull out an r, school, let's see, an r to the two-thirds. Because, let's see, I want r squared, I want to pull it, well, we'll pull it out in here. No, I want an r cubed, because if I have r cubed, then, ah, we'll do it in two steps. I want to write this as r squared, yeah, it's an r cubed. I'm going to write it as r squared times x over r quantity squared plus 1, all of this to the 3 halves. But r squared to the 3 halves is just r cubed. So I am left with three halves there and r cubed there. And that leaves me, once I've factored out, so I have r squared over r cubed. So I just have mu naught over 4 pi r times this. Now this is a unitless quantity. So this tells me that this is what my, this is going to be the units of my magnetic field. And now, if I want to consider the, what would happen for an infinite wire, I am going to, uh, now I can change my variables. So I have called u equals x over r, and then du equals dx over r. So my u's are just in there. All right, now I need to do this integral. All right, so now we have to do this integral. How are we going to do this integral? Well, I will tell you how you would set it up, and then we're just going to use an integral table. So the, it, you would have to do a u substitution where you, this is your variable. And then when you do that, the problem is that when you take the derivative of this, it is going to give you a variable. <laughs> so you have to do, uh, you would have to do, uh, not only u substitution, but um, but you would also have to do integration by parts in order to get the the whole integral done. And it's not something you know. This is not a calculus class. So what we're going to do is that we are just going to use 
the integral that we have. So uh, now, if you don't know what an integral table is, this is a lovely time in your career to learn what an integral table is. An integral table is a place where you can look up the answers to a whole bunch of integrals. When I was a student, I used to want to try to be tough. I'm like, well, I'm going to do all of these integrals and just prove that I can. And it's good to exercise your calculus muscles within reason. Um, it's also easy to make a stupid mistake. Our goal here is not to, you know, don't torture yourself too much. What I, my rule when I was grading, when I grade stuff, my rule is you can use an integral table, but you have to tell me that you use the integral table. That is, you have to tell me what strategy you use to solve the problem. And integral tables are allowed, um, as are programs like Mathematica and Maple, but tell me that you used it. All right, so the answer to this integral is our constants come along for the ride. And then the integral is x over x squared plus r squared. Let's see. Let me put this as, yeah, it is, sorry, the way that I have written it, the integral is u over u squared plus 1 to the 3, or sorry, to the 1 half. And then this goes, we need the limits from negative infinity to infinity. And here, this one is tricky. So when you put the limits in, because your limits are negative infinity and infinity, you actually have to um, take, so you're looking at the limit as this thing goes to infinity, and that is the limit as u goes to infinity of the derivative of the top divided by the derivative of the bottom. One half u squared plus 1 to the 2 u. And uh, let's see, is this, ah, to the 1 half. And uh, da, 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 da. this should. Let's see, or I can just look at this. And that doesn't quite give me. All right, I'm going to do what everybody else does and say it is left as an exercise to the student to show that this is equal to 2. The reason why it gets really hairy and ugly is because to take this to do this and consider what happens at the limits, you have to take the derivative of the top and divide it by the derivative of the bottom. You will learn how to do that at some point in a calculus class, but you can also look up what it is in an integral table. So you get the answer that for an infinite wire, the magnetic field at a point P above the wire, uh, a distance R above the wire, is mu naught over 2 pi R. Um, so we will also later on learn another technique where you that you can use to figure out that um, that that magnetic field. It's called Ampere's law. So it's analogous to Gauss's law, where you basically use the symmetry of the situation of the problem, and uh, you don't have to do a single integral. Never, nonetheless, do you have to do a horrible, ugly integral that's a pain to set up. So. Sometimes, remember, Gauss's law, Ampere's law. My first rule is that a good physicist is a lazy physicist. So when it is possible to do something an easier way, you should. All right. Now, um, that gives us the answer for the next part. The magnetic field around a wire is given by, the magnitude of the magnetic field around a wire is given by mu naught i divided by 2 pi r. And to get the direction, take your thumb, 
point it in the direction of the current, curl your fingers around it, whatever the direction of your fingers, that gives you the direction of the magnetic field around the wire. So that if the wire is pointing out at you, the magnetic field around that wire wraps around like this. So what can we do with that? Uh, that is basically saying what I just said. Um, oh, and I was using my right hand, which is my left hand to you. So now point your thumb in the direction of the current and above the wire, it points towards you. Below the wire, it points towards me. And here you can see the shape of the magnetic field wire lines around a wire. What you can see here is that uh, this is showing as uh, showing what happens with compass needles. And here you can have a plane where you have uh, you have a wire going up and down, going straight through the plane, and then you have iron filings which are magnetized on the plane, and they will line up in circles around it, because the magnetic field around a wire is it goes around in circles wrapped around the wire. All right, here is an example, um, and I am going to go ahead and just for good measure, keep our equation up here, mu naught over two pi i over r. We're gonna be using that one, and this says, these three currents have wires flowing into the page. That is, that they look like to you like they are going towards me. So those three wires have currents going into the page, and they are in a square. We will call it a square of length L. And what is the magnetic field at point P? So first of all, left hand, left hand. Um, I have to use what you think is my right hand. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll call this, this is my right hand, but this is my stage right hand. So I have to remember to use my stage right hand. All right, then when we are at point P, we are gonna line that thumb up with the direction of the magnetic field, curl the fingers in, and at point P, the, the current is down. And it is down for all three of the wires. It is always, oh wait, no, no, no. At point, so this one, it is down. This one, it is that way. It is actually at an angle. And this one, it is, uh, this one, it is that way. So the way that these magnetic fields add, we have to consider vectors. Remember, you guys learned that at the beginning of the last semester. You're going to be using it over and over and over again. All right, so, um, and then what we are told in this problem is that the, let's see, are we, it does not say what the, um, well, the example as done in the book actually has the, the currents all be the same. We will leave them arbitrary. Um, so, I'm going to put in a set of coordinates here. Whoop, whoop, y, and x. All right, so the magnetic field from the first current is mu naught i over 2 pi r. And then the magnetic field, got to remember to use my stage right hand. The magnetic field is a, has a, this is I1, and this has a direction of negative y hat. The third one is actually easier than the second. So same form, mu naught I2 over 2 pi r. And then we have to, so, Whoop, whoop, it is in the negative x direction. Now, because this one, ha this has the same 
length the magnetic field at from wire 2 is at a 45 degree angle from the x-axis in the negative direction. That is that the unit vector is uh, 1 over the square root of 2, negative 1 over the square root of 2 times x hat plus y hat. So that is our unit vector in the direction of the magnetic field due to current 2. And, ah, and here, if I'm using my length, I can replace that r by the length all right and magnetic field due to wire 2 is negative 1 over the square root of 2 this is from that unit vector in the direction of the magnetic field mu naught i2 over 2 pi now the distance is the square root of 2 times L. Um, and then I have x hat plus y hat. So I get an extra factor of 2 from that. All right, and then I can add them all together. Um, if I'm keeping everything general, that does not, in, that does not add a lot of information. So I'm not going to step through those steps. All right, and then, uh, and this just shows the, the solution, shows vectors pointing in the direction of each of the different magnetic fields. All right, a magnetic field produced by a long straight conductor is perpendicular to a parallel conductor as indicated by, uh, by the right-hand rule. Okay, so here you have a long straight conductor um, parallel to, uh, perpendicular to a parallel plate conductor, to a parallel conductor. A view from above the two wires with the magnetic field lines shown for wire one shows that the force between the parallel conductors, is, okay, so this is looking at two wires. What is the force between the two wires? If you are, i uh, got to use my stage, right? Um, so here you have the, um, actually we will look at this one. This one is a little bit more useful. The current is pointing towards U. And then when uh, we wrap our finger around it, then what you see is the magnetic field as shown. So then the magnetic field on wire two from wire one the magnetic field is up over here. So then we have a, um, and then uh, this wire has a current towards U. So V cross V, and I'm getting an F in the opposite direction. And that is because I am using, because I have this annoying mirror image. So, ah, because I need to have that, yes, this one, I need to, it is actually pointing towards me, not you. So I have to swap the direction of all of those arrows. This is the magnetic field. The current is pointing towards me here. The current, the velocity is towards me. The magnetic field is down. So the force on that wire is towards the other wire. So when you have two wire, parallel wires that, are, that have currents in the same directions, the force between them is attractive. Um, if you have two parallel wires where the currents are in the opposite directions, the force is repulsive. All right. And then, 
So now we have two current carrying wires given at, loca at given locations with currents out of the page. The, we have the general result can be derived with lots of other ugly integrals, like many things in physics. The general result is that the force divided by the length between two wires is given by u naught times the product of the currents divided by 2 pi r. Let's see, ah, l, is the, um, l is the length of the wire. Um, so the force per unit length of wire, if, so if you have infinite wires, then the force per unit length is, the, is given by this, and this gives you the, um, this gives you the magnitude of the force per unit length. So here, if I have two current carrying wires, um, now to get the, I have to calculate the distance between them. So this distance r is the square root of three squared plus four squared, which is equal to five centimeters. So that is what you would plug in here. You have your two currents, physical constants, and that gives you the force per unit length. That means, the fact that this is a force per unit length means that if you have a longer wire, then the force gets larger, but, you, but often what, what really matters in that situation is the force per unit length, because if you have an infinitely long wire, the absolute force doesn't really matter very much. Infinite wires don't exist anyhow. All right, determining the magnetic field at a point P along the, x -ax, uh, along the axis of a current carrying loop of wire. So, what we can do here, what we would do here, and I'm actually going to skip over this because this lecture is already kind of long. You use your Biot-Savar law, and then you're going to put the, um, you're going to choose one direction, one, say the xy plane, to put the, um, to put the loop in, and then you calculate the magnetic field above that. Um, and you calculate each of the different elements, and you can do the integral over the, the whole loop. There's a few different other ways that you can do this. Um, in the interest of time, I will simply, and not taking forever on this lecture, we, I will just simply write down the answer. not a pi, mu naught over 2r, and then this is in the uh, direction perpendicular to the, the loop of wire. Um, so if you have, uh, so here if we look at what's going on, this has, I got to use my stage, right? So actually, in this direction, the way that it is written, it would point in that direction. Of course, our coordinate system is not right-handed because of the fact that we're looking at the mirror. So the, for a right-handed coordinate system, we would just need to swap the direction of the y-axis, and then you would find that the, um, the magnetic field points in the y-axis, the way that this is set up. And if you go around the loop, so it's in the y-axis. So it, let me draw it over here so that you have, um, so that there's a clearer picture. So if we have current in the loop like this, an I, not a J. Now, I've got to use my stage right, line my thumb up with the, um, with the current, and... The magnetic field inside the loop points towards you. Rather than using formulas, what I would encourage you to always do is look at the problem, use your right hand rule, and try to double check that you actually understand what direction that magnetic field or the force, whatever it is that you're calculating, should be in. Because uh, you can have different coordinate systems. It's actually rather common that we would say, you know, the problem in the book, the equation in the book tells you what happens if 
the, um, if the current loop is in the xz plane, but now I've told you that the current loop is in the xy plane, and instead of the current going clockwise, it's going counterclockwise. So always double check with your right hand rule and make sure that the answer that you are getting makes sense. All right, and then you can calculate the uh, magnetic field lines of a circular loop of current. I'm gonna do that over here. I'm not going to correct this one because, well, it gets a little confusing. Are you looking at the current going into the page or out of the page? Depends on which way you look. So here, I am going to draw the current loop, and now I'm going to use my stage right hand and line my thumb up with the, um, with the current, and you can see that the magnetic field points towards you when we are inside of the circle, and then outside of the circle, the magnetic field points towards me. So you see it as if you're looking at the, at the end of the arrow. All right. Here you have two different loops of current have the same, uh, two different loops of of different radii have the same current but flowing in opposite directions. The magnetic field at point P is measured to be zero. And to calculate that, what we need is the magnetic field at a point along a point P above the axis for a wire. And I'm just going to look at the magnitude. And that magnitude is U naught I over to times for a loop of wire the radius squared over the distance squared plus the radius squared to the three halves. All right. So, at point P, the magnetic field from the first loop, we have a radius, I uh, will call this, um, we have a radius of R, and we will call this L over 4, um, and our magnetic field is mu naught I over two, and then this is radius squared over L squared over 16 plus R squared to the three halves. Then from the second loop, I still have mu naught I over two, and now I have 4 r squared over 3, ah, 3 times, oops, 3 squared, so 9 over 16 l squared. plus 4r squared to the 3 halves. Ah, and this must not match the example in the book, or the example changed in different versions. So the net magnitude is not, in fact, zero the way that this problem is set up. But what you should see is that you can calculate the total magnetic field. Um, the magnetic field is additive, so if you start having multiple different components and they're all contributing different, uh, in different ways, then you can just add up the magnetic fields from each different component. And there are a variety of different problems. So how do you have... How do you add up different components? How do you come up with clever ways to add them up? It's near infinite number of 
possibilities. All right, then we can move on to Ampere's law. So if you guys remember, if you guys, if you like, if you like Gauss's law, you're going to love Ampere's law. Ampere's law is another is one of these laws of symmetry that let you calculate the magnetic field without actually knowing very much about the situation at all. Um, and what this says is, so here, if we have, Ampere's law says that if you do a path integral um, around a magnetic field, the path integral of B dot dl around that path is equal to mu naught times the current. Now, if you are concurrent, if you have not yet taken Calc 3, or if you are um, currently in Calc 3, you won't be that comfortable with a path integral. But what the only path integrals that we are going to do in this class involve the magnetic field always being exactly parallel to or exactly anti-parallel to the path that you go around in the circle. So... What that means, here you have a circular path integral, um, and you're going, and you do, or sorry, you have a magnetic field, sorry, the magnetic field is shown in the loop, and then you're going to do the path integral, so you are going to take a small segment dl, and you're going to do b dot dl around the entire path, and um, that is going to, uh, and what Ampere's law tells you is that the total path integral is mu naught times the sum of the currents enclosed in that loop. So here you have enclosed that current. So this, um, this path integral is going to be equal to mu naught times the current. In this path integral, um, you do not actually enclose any currents, so no matter what the magnetic field is, then you are going to have a net path integral of zero because you do not enclose any currents. That's saying that whatever, so your actual magnetic field depends on the radius from the wire. This is showing the wire going in the page and either way. So if you have not, when you're here, the magnetic field is weaker than when you're there, and then it, it changes if you get slightly separated from, if you change your radius ever so slightly. Um, Ampere's law tells you all that stuff cancels out, and the only thing that matters is the total amount of current that is enclosed by your path. Okay, so what you have to consider is what are possible components of the magnetic field due to a given current. Um, so in this case, the current, i got to use my stage right, the current... <laughs> The current is directed um, towards U, and if we do this path integral, so we're going to do an integral around a circle. So our path, we will choose the x-axis here, because why not, and the y-axis there, and we're going to use radial coordinates because radial coordinates are the natural, so the, the origin, the current, the wire of current is exactly in the origin. And we will go around counterclockwise so that our small segment DL, we're gonna choose to be a distance R away from the center, and our small distance DL at any given point in the path, we'll choose here for our example. So this is a distance r away and a distance, an angle theta above the axis. And dl is equal to r d theta. So if we want to set up our path integral around a closed path, the, so we have to do... I'm going to go back, b dot dl. All right, the only thing that can contribute to that particular integral is a, is a magnetic field, which is in the theta direction. So our b dot dl has to be b in the theta direction, and then dl is always going to be... Um, so our B is always going to be in the theta hat direction, 
and that is always, so theta hat in polar coordinates is perpendicular. So r hat in polar coordinates is like this. Theta hat is perpendicular to that, and it points in the direction of increasing theta. So once you have defined, I've got to use my stage, right? Once you have defined r hat to be um, in pointing towards the point, then theta hat has to be perpendicular to it. It can be either there or there, and you want it to be pointing in the direction of increasing theta. Theta in, we have theta increasing, going. It looks to me like it is counterclockwise, so it should look to you like it is clockwise. Um, so r hat is going to point in that direction. It's got to point in the same direction, in the direction that theta hat increases. So our d, uh, our uh, b dot dl is always going to um, be, they're always perpendicular. We're going to end up with r d theta. And if we want to include, we want to do our path around the entire circle, so we are going to use integration limits from 0 to 2 pi. And that has to equal mu naught times the current enclosed. So I can get 2 pi r times b theta equals mu naught i. And from that, I get that b in the, in the theta hat direction is equal to mu naught i over 2 pi r. That was a lot less painful than what we had to do when we integrated the big ugly integrals. This is why Ampere's law is awesome. And remember, a good physicist is a lazy physicist, so this made it less work for us to do. So now why is there, so what can we say about r b in the r hat direction? Well, with this particular path integral, you can't ever get an r in the theta direction. It can't ever contribute. Um, it can't contribute to this integral. So if this is really, and by symmetry, you have to have the same. Um, so you have, in this problem, you have radial symmetry. So whatever theta you're in, your problem has to look exactly the same. So you have to, if you have an r, um, you have to either have a constant theta hat or a constant r, a constant magnetic field either in the theta or the r direction. But there is no way that uh, a magnetic field in the r hat direction can contribute at all be to your path integral. So you can't have an r in the, you can't have a magnetic field component in the r hat direction. So. Ampere's law is beautiful because it takes really problems that you would otherwise have to do really complicated integrals with. You would have to use the Biot Savart law and do cross products and write your answer in a general form and figure out what that, and it's a vector equation, so you have to write a vector in a generalized form and then do an integral over that mess, which means you had to set it up correctly and you have to. Set, you have to actually solve the integral correctly, and there is ample room for mistakes. And Ampere's law turns that into an algebra problem. It's beautiful. All right, now you have a model of a current, so a current carrying wire of radius A and of current I naught. The cr a cross section of the wire showing radius A and Ampere's radius, Ampere's loop of radius R. All right, so now. We're going to do something similar, except when we, uh, we're now going to consider what that magnetic field is inside the wire. If we want to talk about what the magnetic field is inside the wire, we have to know something about the current density inside the wire. Because we have to know how much current is enclosed in the wire. So we're going to do something very similar to the problem before. Uh, we have the um, the when we do our path integral we get b naught times 2 pi times the radius so we're doing a path uh, the, the radius of the path integral so i'm going to do it as a little r well when we're outside the wire it's big r the radius of the wire and then when we are outside of the wire the total current is just I. 
So we will get that the magnetic field outside the wire is mu naught i over 2 pi capital R. Inside the wire, we have something similar. The we're going the um, path integral is b theta 2 pi times the radius that we have gone out to little r. But now we need to know how much current we enclose in the wire. So if we assume that the current density is uniform, then our current is a is the total current divided by the area or the total current divided by pi capital R squared. That's our current density. And then our current actually enclosed is I over is the current density times the area of our integral. And of course, the pi's cancel out on top and bottom here. And we can solve this algebraically now. Again, we have taken an ugly integral that had to be done with cross products and arbitrary unit vectors. And we have made it a geometry problem with algebra. It looks beautiful to me. All right, and then we divide this by 2 pi r, and we get mu naught i over 2 pi, and then one of the r's cancels out here, and we get r over capital R squared. So you can see now that these have the same units. This, is a, this one falls off as you get further and further from the, um, further and further from the wire. This increases linearly as you go out from, from the wire. So then we can look at that here as a function of distance along the wire. So inside the wire, the magnetic field, in the, radi the radial magnetic field increases linearly with the distance from the wire. And outside of the field, it falls off like 1 over r. Um, and we could figure out what the magnetic field was inside of the wire without having done any ugly integrals. And one not so ugly integral. Um, and so what can you say from that? Um, well, there's a few things. We did have a, an assumption in there. So you shouldn't assume that this is the, what the magnetic field looks like for all wires. In real wires, you don't have a quite uniform distribution of current. Um, you, you will get slightly, I believe it's slightly more current out uh, on the edges than in the center. So you will actually get something slightly different from this, but this gives you a pretty good model. Once you get outside of the wire, though, um, your current enclosed is always the total current in the wire. So once you get outside of the wire, you're not at all sensitive to what was going on inside of the wire and what that current density looked like. All right, so these are different um, current configurations for various paths. Now, if you, so you're doing the dashed line, so it shows your path integral, and the, um, and the, then you see different currents traveling through the wire, and um, sometimes they're going in the same direction, sometimes they are going in the opposite direction. So here you have, 7 amps down and 7 amps up. So the net current enclosed is 0. So this one, um, so if you were doing this path integral, you, this would, the total magnetic field, the beam, the magnetic, the path integral over the magnetic field is going to equal 0. Here, you only have one current. It is 2 amps. So you are going to get, uh, the, path, the total path integral equals mu naught times negative 2 amps because it's going down. And then here you have all two, you have 7 plus 5 is 12 going down and 3 going up. So you have a net of 9 going down, 9 amps going down. So your total path integral is mu naught times 9 amps. All right. 
Then we can move on to solenoids. Solenoids are beautiful. I will admit, so solenoids have a special place in my heart because my father is the first person who taught me how to make a solenoidal magnet. It's really cool. I've actually done it with my son now. It means a lot to me. Um, a solenoid is simply a bunch of loops of wire. Um, and when you have uh, multiple loops of wire, because a loop of wire has a magnetic field, which is roughly constant on the inside of the wire, uh, then when you add the magnetic field from a whole bunch of these loops of wire together, you get a roughly constant magnetic field. And the um, total magnetic field is equal to the number of loops times the um, times mu naught times the current. So it has this really beautiful form. So here you can see a picture of a solenoid. Um, when you have a solenoid with a current, let's see, we have, yeah, current, ah, the, the current is pointing towards me here, and it is, let's see, pointing towards me here, and it's pointing towards you there. So inside, so here, the um, inside the loop, the solenoid is, um, the magnetic field is up, and I loop around, it's always up. So I end up with a magnetic field pointing up from having this loop of wire. All right, and then here, if you want to do a path integral to calculate the, um, the magnetic field from a solenoid, Our magnetic field is in this direction. So in this path, the magnetic field and the DL are parallel. And so we only have, and then in this, for, for paths two and four, the magnetic field is perpendicular to the DL. So there is no contribution. Um, the magnetic field is from this, these wires, so okay, now this is pointing towards, this says the current is pointing towards me, so that's this direction. And then, let's see, that's this, uh, yeah, this one flips it. Uh, so we're going to, flip our arrows. Okay, I gotta use my stage right hand. And now the current is, let's see, the magnetic field is, my, sorry, my current is pointing towards me. You see this pointing towards you see the current pointing towards me, which means that inside it, uh, I think I didn't need to switch them on this one. Um, and then when you do, but regardless, the direction of the magnetic field is, uh, so B dot DL is in one direction this way. Outside, it's in the same direction because when you are outside of the solenoid, the magnetic field switches and the direction of the path integral switches. So your total path, you have B times 2L, that's your path, and then we're going to the total amount of current, so it's mu naught times the number of loops enclosed times the, um, let's see, the number of loops per unit length times the length. And that number of loops per unit length is little n in your book. 
So you get that the magnetic field is mu naught times the number of coils per unit length, I over I. I over 2, but I want I forgot that you actually have to get the, um, you want to do, you want to do the, you have contributions from, that's only the contribution from the top set of coils, and you want to multiply by 2 to get the total number of coils, so you get, uh, or the total number of contributions, so you get mu naught n times i. All right, so then we can look at the field lines and compare the field lines around a bar magnet and a solenoid. So regardless, if you go far enough out, you're going to see that all of the field lines, the, the field lines wrap around and every field line leaving ends up returning because we do not have um, magnetic monopoles. Uh, but you end up with slightly different shapes for a bar magnet and a solenoid. And crucially, inside the solenoid, that magnetic field is roughly constant. Then we can move on to toroids, which are another specific example. So in this case, uh, in a toroid, instead of having it, uh, instead of having a loop of wire, you have a donut of coils. So you take a solenoid and you wrap it around. Um, it does not have to be cylindrically symmetric, um, but it can be, and then you can choose different paths of integrations. And the, um, the magnetic field inside the toroid has another beautiful, simple form. And then we will move on to examples. All right, so the first one, uh, you have a 10 amp current through, flowing through a 0.5 millimeter segment of wire. Um, and what is it measured at point A and point B? So here we're going to use the approximation that the, um, we're going to use the Biot-Safarat law, and we're going to use the approximation that we don't need to consider the edges very much, because if you have 0.5 centimeters, that is very small compared to 3 centimeters and 4 centimeters, so we don't have to be too worried about it. And it asks specifically for the magnitude, so we're not going to worry about direction. We are, then we look up our Biot-Safarat law, and it says that the um, it says that the magnetic field for a small segment of wire is mu naught over 4 pi D, I DL cross with R hat uh, and then divided by R squared. So for the first one, so what is it at point A? U naught over 4 pi. Here, this is in SI units, so we're just going to convert everything to SI units. Um, there is 10 amps. The small segment of wire is 0.5 millimeters, or 10, 5 times 10 to the negative 4 meters. And then our hat. So we need the DL, our DL is always going to be in this direction, D, ooh, as soon as I, if I don't erase with the cloth, it's totally illegible, so DL is like that, and in the first case, our R hat is like this, so DL cross R hat, they're 90 degrees away from each other, the magnitude of that is just one. And then R squared is 3 centimeters squared, so 9 times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared. So that's the first one. B, we have mu naught over 4 pi. The 10 amps stays the same. The DL stays the same. 5 times 10 to the negative 4 meters and now we have the distance is equal to the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is 5. Um, so it is 5 squared, or 25, times.
times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared. And now we have to consider uh, what the cross product of the sign between uh, r hat and l hat. So that sign of that angle is 3 over 5. So this, we want the sign of, uh, actually, wait a minute, it is the sign of the angle between them, which is, this is r hat, yeah, this is r hat in that case, so we want this angle, so it is 3 over 5. And that is it. Okay, so now we have 10 amps going through a square loop where each side is 20, meters, 20 centimeters in length. At each corner of the loop is a one milli, or 0.1 millimeter segment that connects to the longer wires. Calculate the magnitude of the, of the magnetic field at the center of the loop. So what we, we are going to use our equation for the magnitude due to a long straight the magnitude due to a straight wire and we have to take note of the reason why that uh, that magnitude is why those little segments are important so let's see do we have in the picture there, it's not terribly clear what direction the current is flowing in. Um, it doesn't say, and it's not obvious, but we're going to draw an arbitrary direction. So we will choose the current to be flowing in this direction, which means that it is, as it wraps around, it does this, and then um, when we, I have to remember to use my stage right hand, so uh, line my finger up with the, line my thumb up with the current, and inside it is pointing towards me uh, from the first wire, and from the second wire, it is pointing towards you. So these two wires, wire one points like this, wire one, wire two, let's see, wire one, wire two, wire three, all right, so each of these components uh, adds up. We're actually going to use a uh, result there's for a short, a finite segment of wire um, where the magnetic field from a finite segment of wire is equal to u naught i over 4 pi times the distance to that segment, and then sine of the angle from one point the minus sine of the angle to the other. Now, when we get here, the problem is that these guys cancel out. So when you consider that, to let's see, ah, but one of them is a positive angle, the other is a negative angle. So when you are at the center of a square, let me erase that. When you're at the center of a square, this is a 45 degree angle, and this is a 45 degree angle. So 
One of them is positive, the other is negative. So this has the magnitude 2 over the square root of 2. And then we have four such segments. If we use our right-hand rule, the four such segments all um, add up in the same direction. So we get 4 over the square root of 2, mu naught i over 4 pi times then the distance to this point. Uh, that particular point is the length over 2. And then uh, we have to consider the short segments of wire and we are going to use the, um, so this is the long segments of wire, and then the, um, the short segments of wire have a similar form. But now we're going to use the biot savart law. And neglect see, mu naught i over 4 pi, and then we have v l cross r hat over r squared. Now this is 0 0.01, and this is going to be so our r hat is perpendicular now to, the, um, to that angle. So this is 0.01 centimeter, and the other length is 20 centimeters. So we're actually going to neglect that contribution, and we only have to consider the, um, the four square edges. It turns out that the little corners don't make a big difference. Okay, so now we have the question, what is the magnetic field at a point P due, the, due to the current in a wire, the wire as shown below? So um, when we are here, um, so we always have in the biot savart law, we have I crossed with R hat, and now R hat is parallel or anti-parallel to r hat. So we don't have to consider, consider the two short segments of wire. Uh, what we do need is to consider for a full circle, the magnetic field is mu naught i over 2r, where r is the radius. And now we have a half circle. When we have a full circle, each half of the radius contributes the same magnetic field, and um, and it just so we don't have to worry about um, and the left side. So we only have to worry about the um, the components perpendicular to the plane because the left side cancels out the right side. So as long as we have some symmetry, we don't actually have to worry about anything except the magnetic field in. So we don't have to consider about anything, anything except the magnetic field in this direction. When we have a half circle, we have half of this because we've only got half the contribution. So if we have, so in this direction, so when the, when the current is pointing like, let's see, I gotta use, so I gotta use my stage right hand. So above the wire, it is pointing towards you. Below the wire, it is pointing towards me. Um, and here, above the wire, it is pointing towards me. And below the wire, it is pointing towards you. So these two magnetic fields are in opposite directions. The one that comes from the lower segment has a, li has a larger magnitude. So it's going to be, we'll put it first. So the net magnetic field is mu naught i over 4r. So that's 
half of what it is for one full segment, or sorry, mu naught i over 4, and then we're going to put 1 over a minus 1 over b. Um, and then the magnetic field is pointing towards you there, so me, me here, so you there. So the net magnetic field is pointing towards you in that case. For this one, we have a quarter segment of wire, so it's very much the same. Either, you know, we still have the segments of wire, which are, um, so R hat is in this direction, and I hat is in that direction, so those, the, the end wires don't actually contribute. For a full circle, we have mu naught i over 2 divided by the radius of the wire. For a full circle, for a quarter circle, we are going to have one quarter of that. So our net magnetic field is mu naught over 8 times i, and then 1 over a minus 1 over b. And the net magnetic field the contribution from A is larger, so it's going to be pointed towards you. Okay, so this problem is asking you to find the magnetic field at the center, and now you've got a rectangle. So this is similar to the one that we did a couple times before. I am going to use a similar result that the magnetic field for a segment, a finite segment of wire is mu naught i over 4 pi and then the length to the wire, and then uh, sine of one angle minus sine of the other. And then that distance is, so what, how could you get this? Now this, I got out of a different book, but what, um, but what you could do is that you can start with the, um, you can start with the problem in, uh, for a finite, start with the setup due to a long, thin, straight wire, which is in section 12.2, and then instead of putting the integration limits as positive and negative infinity, you can set them as finite. But, you know, often, so this is not a good problem for a class that has not had calculus. You would really have to do some calculus to do that integral or use the result from something else. All right, so we are still going to have the symmetry that the signs of the angles on the edges are um, the same and have the same magnitude and are opposite in sign. Um, in all cases, the magnetic fields add together. So um, this is going to end up uh, because we have, so the distance, we'll consider first the two shorter segments of wire. And then there are two segments. So we're going to get a factor. We're going to start with our constants mu naught i over 4 pi, and then the distance from the shorter segment of the wire is a over 2, and then we have two segments of wire. So I'm going to just add up both segments at the same time. We have sine of one minus the sine of the other, but the sine of the other, uh, this angle is negative of that one, so we end up twice the, uh, another factor of two from the sine of the angle between them. And that angle is the angle from, is this angle right there. Um, and that angle is, well, I'm actually, going to draw it as, well, we'll do it some, we'll do it like this. So this angle is one half of a squared plus b squared, because the whole length is this, one half the square root of a squared plus b squared, 
and this length is b over 2. So our sine is b over 2 divided by 1 half a squared plus b squared, and that gives us b over a squared plus b squared square root, and that is the short segment B long has mu naught i over 4 pi. And now this distance from the long segments, instead of being a over 2, is b over 2. There are two segments of wire, and there's symmetry in the signs, so we get the um, we get those again. And now we're after the, ah, I did screw that one up. This, I want the sign of this angle for the first one, which has a list, a distance a over two. So here I have the distance to the wire is a over two and then the sine is a over 2 over this mess. Here, the distance is b over 2. Let's see. Ah, I, yeah, I had it right the first time. This one should be a b. And this one is an A. And then I end up with a, an overall mu naught I. And then I am left with a factor of 2, and then I have this in the denominator, and I have a over b plus b over a. Okay, now this one says there's two long straight wires that are parallel to and a distance that are parallel and a distance of 2a apart. So if the wires are both carrying current A in the same direction, what is the magnetic field um, at point one and at point two? All right, so at point one, the magnetic field due to uh, due to the upper wire, is pointing towards me. And at point two, the, the magnetic field at the, from the lower, or sorry, point one, the magnetic field from the lower wire is pointing towards you. And they are both the same, they have the same current, so the, the magnetic fields have the same magnitudes. So the net magnetic field at this point is zero because those two magnetic fields exactly cancel out. And then it asks, what is the magnetic field at point B? Now, in this case, both of those wires um, are going to give a magnetic field pointing towards me. So those two wires are additive. And then we need the magnetic field due to a current in a wire, which is mu naught over mu naught i over 2 pi times the distance from the wire. 2 pi times the distance from the wire. So for the, the total magnetic field from the first wire, so we have this constant factor, mu naught i over 2 pi, and then from the first wire, the distance at point P2 is 4a, and from the second wire, it is 2a. So... This is 1 over 4a 
1 plus 2, or 3 over 4a. So this works out to be 3 eighths, because I'm combining it with that factor of 2, mu naught i over pi. This one is very similar. We're going to be using the same equation. The, the magnetic field from a long thin wire. A circuit with current I has two long parallel wires that carry current in opposite directions. Find the magnetic field at point P near these wires that is a distance A from one wire and a distance B from the other wire as shown in the figure. All right, so here, uh, when you, so this guy, the magnetic field is up um, and it's actually going to be it's actually going to be in this direction for that second wire. And for, the, for this wire, it is, at that point, it is, let's see, at that point, it is in this direction. So you're going to have to... Um, First, we'll get the magnitude of the first wire. I'm going to put a coordinate system on this. And my coordinate system is going to be x and y. And um, I have, in the first case, mu naught i over 2 pi a. That is my magnitude. And my unit vector in, well, ooh, this one's a little bit tricky because my unit vector, I'm always perpendicular to r hat. So if this is, I have to go, let's see, b hat, and this is, a squared minus b squared square root. And so this, let's see, a unit vector in that direction. Ah, I'm not sure that Cartesian coordinates was the best choice, but I made it, so I'm going to stick with it. Uh, and I want to, let's see, that angle, I've got, so that angle sine of theta is B over A. And I actually have, I want the cosine of that angle. Wait, I want the, the sine of its complementary angle. So I am going to, well, I'll just write it in terms of theta and leave it as an exercise for the student to calculate the numerical values. So uh, my y component is, so I still want b over a y hat. And I want negative a squared minus b squared square root over a x hat. And that is the first one. The second one, so this is b, 
and it is entirely in the negative y hat, or let's see, no, it's in the, entirely in the positive x hat direction. So that's my full, um, that's the magnitude, uh, that's the full magnetic field. To get the magnitude, I would have to get the individual components. The example in the book, uh, I, I believe the example in the book has actual numbers. All right, I'm just going to tell you how to set this one up. You would do more of the same. The infinite straight wire in the accompanying figure carries current I1. The rectangular loop whose sides are parallel to the wire carries current I2. What is the magnitude of the direction and force on the rectangular loop due to the magnetic field of the wire? So what you would do here is consider the, um, the forces on each of the individual segments. Those individual, the forces on those individual segments. You can look up the force on two parallel, the force per unit length. is the, is mu naught, I1, I2, divided by 2 pi times the distance between them. So you calculate the force per unit length on this segment, add the force per unit length on that segment. And then um, this is only for parallel wires. Uh, when you have current in this direction, the velocity of the positive charge is in, is in this direction. And the, um, and then, uh, I gotta use my stage right hand. So here on that segment, this is, you've got V in this direction and then V in that direction. Your net force is in that direction and the net force is in this direction for that one. So the net forces from these two segments cancel out, and it asks you to find the, the force on the loop. So you only need to, comp to, com to consider these two segments. Now, in that actual field, you would have a torque because the forces are different on the top and the bottom segments of the wire, but you do not actually have a net force. All right. And this is asking you to evaluate the path integrals around the different paths. And the net, um, the path integral is always mu naught times the sum of the currents. So in this one, the sum of the currents enclosed is I. So it's mu naught I. In this one, you have I plus negative I. So you have no net current. In this, uh, so you have no net uh, so the, the path integral is zero. In this one, you have a current loop, which is, um, it encloses the current I, so you have zero. And then this one is a little bit tricky because they've placed, so you've got a uh, square and they're cutting, they're taking your, uh, the surface and putting it, uh, and making it slice through. Now in one direction, the current's going in and in the other, the current's going out. So the, so this path integral is also zero. All right, more of these. So you have to add up the total current enclosed in the first one. It is mu naught times two amps. The, the total current is two amps, so the, that path integral is mu naught times two amps. In this one, it is plus, two, plus five amps minus two amps plus six amps, or 11 minus two is nine amps. So mu naught times nine amps, I think you get the idea. All right, and here we're gonna use Ampere's law and we will, so that says that the current enclosed, so in this case, we're always gonna be dealing with current, with sorry, magnetic fields that are only in the theta direction and we're always going to do uh, circular path integral. So we have 2 pi times the radius of the path e integral, and that is mu naught times I enclosed. And this, this says here you have a hollow cylindrical conductor of radius R1, an inner radius R1, outer radius R2, and the current is uniformly distributed over the cross section um, and it should indicate 
the, the cross section is, I believe this one says it's only in the, the gray area. Yeah, it's a cylindrical conductor. So you have no current inside. So if you have no current inside, inside your magnetic field is zero. And the tricky part here is that now we're assuming a uniform current density. So then we have to calculate uh, the total area of this. The total area is um, pi r2 squared minus r1 squared. And then the current enclosed, if you are not all the way out through the cylinder, is equal to the area that you have included. So pi r squared, assuming that r is larger than r2, minus r1 squared. And then your d theta times 2 pi r is equal to mu naught, oh, and this should be over the total area, mu naught times r squared minus r1 squared over r2 squared minus r1 squared. And that gives you a rather ugly expression, um, but that will give you, so b theta on the inside is that, and b theta in the intermediate region is mu naught, ah, and this is, this should be this is the area enclosed times I divided by the total area. So I should have mu naught I times this mess. So I get mu naught I over two pi R, R squared minus R one squared over R two squared minus R one squared. And then outside, this just looks like a regular wire, mu naught i over 2 pi r. And these end up being exactly equal at r equals r2, because this extra factor goes to 1. OK, I'm not going to work this one out. This works the same way. You consider the total amount of current enclosed. There's a little bit of ugly geometry to make sure that you have the current enclosed correctly. And then you use Ampere's law to figure out what the magnetic field is in the different regions. And what I would encourage you to, to do to check is to the, that the magnetic field should be equal at the edges. Um, so at R1, uh, when you're just barely, a, when R equals R1, this magnetic field should be equal to what it is inside there. Uh, so it should be a continuous distribution. Um, this, you're considering a, the um, magnetic field of point P above the, a square loop of wire, and you can use symmetry here as well. So you have to consider that the, there is a vector for each of these different segments, and the components that are um, not perpendicular to the surface end up this component cancels that component, and this component cancels that component. So you only have to consider the components perpendicular to the surface of the loop, but you have to add those vectors carefully to make sure that you're getting, that, getting them correctly. And I think we'll skip this one, and with that, I will go ahead and end the chapter. And thank you very much, and see you for the next one.